name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we thank God and praise God for you and your family joining in with us today on this Wow Wednesday Bible Study Experience. And this is Morning Chapel Church, downtown Fort Worth, The Rock Church. And certainly you are welcome uh, as we engage in the Word of God weekly at 6.30 uh, p.m. on the Facebook Live. and. This has been a blessed week this week. I pray that you and your families have been doing awesome this week as we prepare to engage the Word of God. Of course, we walk through James, uh, uh, all five chapters of James, and you can go back and revisit those chapters as they are still available online on, on my um, Facebook page, Kenneth Hollingshed, on the Morning Chapel, uh, CME Church Facebook page those are available to you. So go back and review those. Today, um, this has been in my spirit uh, to share with us as we are still moving throughout this uh, pandemic, this crisis that the entire world is in. This is, this is a global crisis, COVID-19. And um, a lot of people are really stressed out. A lot of people are dealing with some things. We all are dealing with things that we've never dealt with before. We've we have not had to shelter in place. We have not been told to stay home because the, the virus is so extremely contagious. It has no respect of person. And uh, certainly we want to pray for your safety and we want to pray for your health. Stay safe, stay healthy. Uh, that's our mantra as we go forward. And so today we're going to talk about love. We're going to talk about love, how to reach beyond ourselves, uh, take care of our neighbors, take care of our communities. Uh, what are believers supposed to be doing? Uh, one of the things we're supposed to be doing is loving uh, one another, reaching beyond ourselves. And First Thessalonians shares that. First Thessalonians chapter 4 and then of course uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which is considered to be the love chapter. Paul wrote both of these uh, letters one to the church at Thessalonica and the other to the church at Corinth. First Thessalonians chapter four, verse nine says, now about your love for one another. We do not need to write to you for you yourselves have been taught by God to love each other. And in fact, you do love all of God's family throughout Macedonia. Uh, yet we urge you, brothers and sisters, to do so more and more, and to make it your ambition to lead a quiet life. You should mind your own business and work with your hands, just as we told you, so that your daily life may win the respect of outsiders, and so that you will not be dependent upon anybody. That's 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 9 and 10. And of course, we're also going to be referencing uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, known as the love chapter. And I just want to maybe uh, title this Bible study from a hit song uh, that was released in 1984 by a top artist by the name of Tina Turner. She penned this song, the lyrics to the song, What's Love Got to Do With It? What's Love Got to Do With It? Of course, the background behind that particular song is that she was coming out of a horrific divorce. She had been battered in, in a case of a domestic violence kind of marriage by her then husband, Ike Turner. And after the divorce, she was in the throes of trying to come back in her career. And this was her comeback song, What's Love Got to Do With It? And so today we're going to find out what Paul said about love, what he says about it from the context of the letter he wrote to the church at Thessalonica and then the church at Corinth. Love according to the world, the world's definition of love, is, of course, pr profound, tender, passionate affection for another person. When you feel a warm, 
personal attachment or deep affection as for a parent or a child or a friend. Also, the world defines it as sexual passion or desire. The world considers all of those things to be love. But love according to the word of God is almost impossible to contain the true meaning of love with just one statement. Therefore, we must examine several different examples on this word and how this word is used uh, throughout the scripture text. Um, we remember Peter. Peter was so passionate. Matter of fact, when we everything we read about Peter in the New Testament, Peter seemed to be so passionate about what he was doing. He was so enthralled in his emotions, and there, there are always times when the emotions work for him, but there were some times when those emotions did not work. For Peter, I remember in Matthew chapter 14, uh, his willingness to walk on the water. He was willing to walk on the water, to step out on his faith in order to walk toward Jesus. In Matthew chapter 16, uh, his declaration that Jesus was the Christ of God. And then, of course, Matthew 17 and 4, his erroneous desire to build three tabernacles. I want to build three tabernacles on this mountain. I don't ever want to come down from here. Of course, Jesus told him that although we're up here on the mountain, we've got to come down. And then, of course, John 18 and 10, Peter was always the one who had this knee-jerk reaction or knee-jerk decision to defend Jesus. Yet Jesus always talked about love uh, and he talked about it within the context of uh, the Greek word agape. Agape love, sacrificial love, non-partial love. John 3.16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth upon him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So agape love is not mutual in that it did not require us to love him. He loved us first. He loved us first. And so here is the horizontal response to love, not necessarily the vertical response. God is calling for a horizontal response during this crisis. I know that we love God. I know that we always confess how much we love him and how much uh, we adore him, how much we worship him, and how much we praise him. But what does that translate? How does it translate? What does it mean? Well, in a horizontal response, it means that I've got to reach across the aisle. I've got to go across the street. I've got to love my neighbor as myself. And so when, when we do those kinds of things, real love does not require any kind of reciprocation. If I'm loving you, I'm not expecting that in return. I'm loving you because real love does not expect repayment, nor does it inflict any kind of revenge on anyone if you're really, really loving. Real love is able to wish the best for your enemy. That's, that's what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verses 43 through 48. Real love will be offended, but finds a way to forgive the offender. And so we've got to find ways now to get through the rough patches, to get through those places that are difficult for us to love because uh, in a real sense we say some people pastor are so difficult to love but now the real thing is uh, are you willing to extend yourself to love that person regardless of who they are regardless of how they behave uh, because in uh, agape it means that it is simply uh, um, not mutual. It doesn't require anything mutual. Agape is non-partial, is sacrificial love. And so Paul's letter to the church at Thessalonica talks about that when he talks about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 verses 9 and 10, Paul is writing this letter. He calls it a labor of love. He said, you ought to have this labor of love because um, love for one another, love for our community, love for our brothers and sisters, love for uh, one another is the distinguishing mark of the church. That's how people know that we are the church. That's how people know that we are the disciples of Jesus Christ. Uh, they know it by our love. Uh, 
And in contrast to lust that Paul also talked about, uh, Paul now turns to Christian love. Uh, how do we love? How do you interpret your love? Paul uses the Greek word Philadelphia which is uh, writing about the natural affection between uh, natural brothers and sisters in a family. And so the New Testament talks about that same kind of love that we express between one another in this family. This is a family of God. This is a family of, com of, of, of community. This, this are, these are thought leaders. These are faith leaders, if you will, who now share how to live out your love. Uh, now, maybe Paul is writing this uh, uh, because he wants to more so encourage them uh, to keep working on their love. He was not indicting them or correcting them because there was no lack of love. That's why he's talking about love. He He's saying uh, in this narrative, he's saying, keep on loving, keep doing what you are doing. And so Jesus commanded his disciples to, to love one another, even as he had loved them. And then he added to that in John chapter 13, verse 35. And he said, by this, all men will know that you are my disciples. So are you displaying your love? Are you showing your neighbor your love? Again, we're talking about horizontal love, not necessarily the vertical love that we know God has for us and we have toward God. Well, what about the person who says, I love God, but they hate everybody else around them. I love God, but you're still mean. I love God, but you're unforgiving. I love God, but I, I'm so rude. I love God, but all of these other negative uh, and the connotations are attached to us and negative attitudes are, are attached to us. But Paul said, love is the fulfillment of the law. That's what Paul said. So God is the one who teaches us about loving one another. He teaches us how to love. And so in verse number nine, if you read that, uh, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, you have no need for anyone to write you, for you yourselves are taught by God to love one another. He has just mentioned that God gives his Holy Spirit to us, teaching us how to love. And then Romans chapter 5, verse 5 says, he says that the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. And so this whole context uh, is amazing love, how to demonstrate your love, how to walk out in this horizontal context, uh, because there's no need for you to say you love uh, and you never reach out to your brother and you never reach out to your sister. You never try to demonstrate the love. Now is the time during this crisis to demonstrate love, uh, to feed the hungry, to clothe the naked, to, to help those who are unemployed, to, to help those who are having struggles to, to do whatever is necessary to build up this place called uh, Koinonia, this community, this authentic fellowship that all of us should benefit from uh, because no person is an island unto themselves. Uh, everybody's going to need somebody. If you don't think you're going to need somebody, I'm going to say what my mother would say. She would say, just keep living. Just keep living. You're going to need somebody in your life because love is uh, self-sacrificing uh, and it's a caring uh, commitment. Uh, first of all, let, let, me, let me say this about love. This is the emotional element of love that I want to, uh, to help us with. Love is caring. Love is caring. That's the emotional element of love. It's not cold. It's not perfunctory. It's, it's caring. It, it says, uh, I, I'm giving you service, uh, but I genuinely care about you. I want you to be okay. There are a lot of people who are struggling with mental health right now, and they need encouragement. There are a lot of people who are dealing with domestic violence right now. The, the, the percentage of domestic violence is up tremendously high, and somebody, somebody needs to say something and be on the front lines about this to help those persons excuse me, who are in need. And so the actions of our love, that's what we are. We have, we've got to have love in action, not just love in words. A lot of people just have love in words. 
a, a, a wordology, just have a lot of words to say about love. But what about the love in action? So, no, I genuinely care about you because love is a caring commitment. Love is an action that also requires improvement. Everybody has the margin of the space to improve. Just like you've improved, just like God has extended grace toward you in your life, and he's given you the opportunity to grow. He's given you the opportunity to make mistakes, uh, to, to walk through your challenges, to walk through your valleys, uh, to, to maybe stumble over some things. Uh, give the next person that same type of grace. Uh, say, just like the Lord uh, has blessed me and allowed me to move beyond my mistakes, uh, I'm going to extend to you that same kind of grace uh, because that is a standard uh, of love. I, I, I want to, to just cite uh, the book that Dr. Tony Evans uh, wrote, Horizontal Jesus. We did a series uh, on that book in our Bible study a few years back, and the entire book uh, is about one another. The entire book is about reaching across the aisle, uh, uh, going next door to your neighbor. What are you doing in your community? What are you doing for your community? What are you doing to help those who are less fortunate? What are you doing uh, to help the poor? What are you doing to feed the hungry? What are you doing to clothe the naked? What are you doing to help those who are disenfranchised and those who are disproportionately taken advantage of? Uh, those are the persons that we should be on the front line for because that's where Jesus was uh, displaying a uh, horizontal Jesus, uh, not just uh, vertical Jesus. Not just looking up to God, but looking in the face of all of those ills and evils uh, in our communities and in our societies and trying to, to give some kind of bomb in Gilead to, to help those persons uh, who need help. And so in the text of uh, Paul writing this letter to the church at Thessalonica, they were so obsessed with their gifts. They were obsessed with their gifts. They were talking about all these wonderful things that they were, they were doing within the context of the church. But now Paul wants to raise up something else that you need more of. He said, yes, you, you're doing this. Yes, your gifts are strong. And yes, you're doing all of these marvelous and wonderful things. But what about your love? And so I'm going to cross-reference this with uh, Paul's letter to the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, which is the love chapter, and Paul defines love. Let me help you real quick. First of all, he says love is patient. Love is patient. Yes, this, uh, do you have a short fuse? Or, or are you the person who says, I got to hurry up and leave, but you want everybody to wait on you? You want everyone to give you time. Everybody, everybody has to center themselves around your schedule. And what, but as soon as it requires for you to be patient, as soon as it's time for you to say, okay, I've got to wait. I've got to sit in this place and wait it out because love now is patient. I'm defining love for you. Love is kind. Oh, my goodness. Am I kind? Am I gracious to other people? Or do I fall short of my expectations uh, of others? Am I, am I that person who is that? Uh, because someone has said it's just nice to be nice. Nobody has to be kind to you. And so when people are kind to you, uh, be reciprocal and pay it forward. Be kind to someone else as you journey along the way. Not only does Paul share this with the church at Corinth, he says love is not jealous. Oh my goodness, look at that word. That's a bad word right there. In other words, I'm not competing with others I'm trying to get attention, trying to get relationships of the possessions they have. No, I'm not jealous. Jealousy is all about competition. It's all about competing. And we're not called to compete. We're called to complete. We're called to help one another and to build one another up and to try to undergird one another and understand one another. But I know there's a lot of competition 
going on in the body of Christ. I'm not talking about the secular world. I'm talking about the competitiveness in the within the context of the body of Christ. And we have to eliminate that. All of us say we are serving the same God. All of us say we are worshiping the Lord. All of us say that we love the same God. And so there's no need for us to be jealous of one another. And then Paul says... Uh, uh, to the church at Corinth, he says, love does not brag and is not arrogant. My God, am I self-focused? Am I self-centered? Am I always trying to impress others with my achievements and with my opinions and with my knowledge? Well, Paul says, you're arrogant. You're arrogant. And so that constitutes the fact that apparently you don't know what love is this agape love and then he says love does not act unbecomingly what does that mean pastor am i rude am i ruthless do i interrupt others am i not considerate about other people's feelings and other people's points of view you're not the only one that has an opinion you're not the only one that has a point of view you're not the only one that has a reference and so it becomes not so much as love when you ignore other people to single out your opinion only. I have the only opinion. I'm, I'm the arrogant person in the room. I'm here to draw all attention upon myself. And then right underneath that, he says, love does not seek its own. Now, not, not rude. Now, he's talking about persons who are selfish. Do I think about myself do I think about my needs above everybody else's needs? Love does not seek its own. Love seems to look at the other, put others first. Love, love is not provoked. Are you easily offended? Are you easily offended? Do you get angry when people don't do what you want them to do? Let me just break it down like that. Because there are a lot of us who are angry when people do not do not do what we want them to do. We just want it done the way. And it could be a wrong thing, but we just want them to do what we want them to do. And that's not love. Love does not take into account a wrong suffered. In other words, love does not keep score of all of the wrong things you've done. I'm not supposed to pull out my tablet and write everything down that you've done wrong and remind you of your past sins, remind you of your past failures, remind you of all of those things, and then we hold grudges. We hold grudges, and it keeps coming up. It keeps coming up, and I'm wondering, when am I ever going to be able to outgrow this with you? Yes, I made a mistake 20 years ago. I made some mistakes 25 years ago. Why is that still coming up in the conversation? Maybe you do not understand love. Am I quick to forgive? Am I quick to forgive people? Because if I do not forgive, I'm going to allow that, that to occupy space in my mind out rent free. I'm not going to give you a rent-free space in my mind uh, so that I will be, uh, you'll be occupying my brain every day. I'm just going to go ahead and forgive you, give you to God and say, Lord, I'm going to forgive that person. I'm going to release them to you. You deal with them because I've got so many other things to do. And I, I get so tired uh, when I'm weighed down uh, by carrying all of the other people and all of the people I have not forgiven. And so Paul calls it out and he says, don't keep score. Don't keep score of the wrongs that's done to you. Don't keep score of the past sins or failures. Matter of fact, let me just put it this way uh, from a practical context. Uh, how do you treat people that have mistreated you? How do you treat those people that have mistreated you? A lot of people have mistreated me. A lot of people, I can name the things, but that does not call for me to mistreat them in return. I believe it was our former first lady, Michelle Obama, who said, when they go low, we go high. So the lower they go, the higher we ought to go. And so when you're hit below the belt, 
when, when someone mistreats you intentionally, I'm not talking about the stuff that, that just happened. I'm talking about the things that they intentionally, or can I put it this way, deliberately did because they wanted to see you hurt. Well, he says, don't keep record of it. No, don't keep record of it. Love. Love does not rejoice in unrighteousness. Am I glad when I see other people fail? Am I glad when I see other people sin because it makes me look good and it gives me some ammunition against them? No, that's not love. I've got to love them. I've got to support them in terms of, of trying my best to restore them into a place that God is pleased with them. And so now we're talking about this, this love. Paul said that, that love never fails. The supremacy of love. Love is superior to all of the spiritual gifts. Love is superior to the tongues of men and the tongues of angels. Love is superior to prophecy and knowledge and faith. That's what Paul said about it. He said love is, is superior to all of those things. Uh, and then he describes the different types of love, the eros, uh, the stergo, the, the philia. And then he says there is agape love, which is the supreme love, uh, the fourth uh, word that depicts love. And so when we think about all of those things, and finally he says in verses 11 and 12 of that 1 Corinthians chapter 13, he gives illustrations of the temporary nature of the, the gifts and the permanence of love. And he talks about looking in a mirror dimly and seeing uh, him face to face, seeing the Lord face to face. And, and then finally, he says, after we've done all of those things, he says, now faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. And so here we are in the midst of a pandemic talking about love, talking about the permanence of love that abides forever and forever. So in my conclusion, what are you focused on? Are you focused on love? Are you focused on the horizontal Jesus? I, I'm talking about the go into the streets Jesus. I'm talking about the, 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 the reach out to your neighbor Jesus. I'm, I'm talking about the kind of Jesus that, that calls somebody and say, I'm just calling to, to check on you. I don't want anything. I just want to hear your voice. Maybe you need prayer. Maybe you need encouragement. Uh, and if you have and check on the senior citizens, those who have been forgotten, those who have been left out, check on them and call them and say, I'm just trying to check on you because uh, I want to live out what Paul said about love. It should all come back to faith. It all should come back to hope. It all should come back to love because uh, this, uh, these are the priorities of Jesus Christ. The priorities because faith, hope, and love are so important. We should expect to see them emphasized uh, throughout our lives. Where are you with love? Has something thrown you off track? Has someone hurt you so bad that you say, I'll never love again, I'll never trust again? Well, now we need to go and go to God in prayer so that you can remove that person from your heart in a grudgeful manner. You can remove that person from your mind because they're occupying a space in your mind rent-free. They're not paying any rent to be in your head. They're in your head uh, every day. And I'm trying to evict that person from your head and from your spirit so that you will be able to give them to God, give the injury that they did. I know it hurt because I've been hurt before. It was devastating. But now I can no longer allow you to take up residence uh, in my mind. Uh, I've got to say, Lord, I'm going to give that injury to you. Uh, I'm going to give it to you so that you can settle the score because the word of God says vengeance is mine I will repay I'm going to do it it's not going to come in your timing it's going to come in my timing and I will heap coals of fire upon their heads and so let's get in the streets my brothers and sisters let's get on the cell phone let's get on the text messaging whatever we've got to do to connect with the body of Christ helping those persons 
who need the help the most. God bless you is our prayer. As we walk through this teaching, let us pray now together. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you. We praise your name today for the love that you've already shown toward us. And now, Lord, we want to continually demonstrate the love to show it more and more. Just as Paul shared in his letter to the church, at, we want to be like that church, God, not to be so obsessive over all of the other many gifts that we have, but what about love? What about agape love, self-sacrificing love? God bless you as our prayer. Morning Chapel family, we praise God and thank God for you. And we want you to continue to, to watch us on Facebook uh, Live and YouTube Live on every Sunday morning at 11 o'clock a.m. Uh, on our social media platforms. And typically we put that out there. We want to invite you to continue to make donations and give to our ministry, Morning Chapel. Uh, CME Church on the uh, the uh, Easy Tide app, and uh, you can download it to your device. You can go to our website, morningchapel.com. Go to the Give button, take you right there, so that you can give whatever seed that you want to make a contribution to this great ministry downtown Fort Worth. I love you. God loves you even the more. God bless you.